This is a pair of pants. My pants, in fact. Gruds, skivvies, keks. Who doesn't like pants? They're the vital interface between nethers and lower limb covering of choice. An elasticated cuddle at the hinge twixt north and south human. They make us feel comfortable. They make us feel confident. They come in all shapes and sizes, colors and flavors to fit all forms and functions. Superheroes sport them proudly outside their trousers, yet if that most intimate connection is violated in any way, any kind of disruption to our pantly prosperity, then boy, are there a few more unpleasant and discombobulating sensations. It's happening. It's happening. It happened. And that makes pants the perfect metaphor for stable coins. While your regular crypto assets will fling you around like a rag doll and reduce your life expectancy by double digits at least twice a month, stable coins wrap us in a warm embrace and whisper in our ears that maybe, just maybe, things will be okay. They're an anchor, a refuge, and they too come in an abundance of flavors. And by far, the sauciest of them right now are those known as algorithmic stable coins. In the words of one colleague, dude, this is pure filth. I love it. And who am I to argue? But the irony of algorithmic stable coins is that they aren't stable. Not at all. So I ask you this. Are they in fact sexy AF? Or are they just a load of pants? This is the Defiant. So yes, today we're talking about stablecoins, which went massive last year. Well massive, growing from $2.6 billion in May of 2018 to over $34 billion this week. And there's currently over 200 privately developed stablecoins out there with catchy names like BUSD, QUSD, HUSD, TUSD, and GUSD, which if you say it just right, sounds suspiciously like gusset. There is a case for every fiat currency to have a digital equivalent, not to mention individual institutions also developing their own as a cheap and fast means of settlement, like JPM coin. And with the explosion of DeFi, we saw them race to product market fit last year and at enormous scale. Tether, of course, is the undisputed king with a $24 billion market cap, but second place USDC is rapidly heading towards $5 billion. And that's big. But doesn't it feel like we're really only just getting started? Now, most stablecoins are backed by off-chain collateral like USD. The stablecoin is a digital representation of the funds that collateralize it, and every unit represents a claim on the issuer over the funds it receives from the users. But the problems with this are twofold. What if the off-chain collateral doesn't really exist? An accusation that's been lobbed at Tether recently. And what if the issuer decides that you're a bad actor and blacklists you, no access to your funds? And that means that this key primitive and decentralized activity is both centralized and very much not censorship resistant. Now, one solution to this has been to create crypto collateralized stablecoins where the digital assets provide the backing rather than banks or cash using CDPs or collateralized debt positions. DAI is the best known of these, but Synthetics SUSD is definitely worth a mention. Now, both of these are over collateralized by crypto assets and rely on price oracles to maintain the peg to the US dollar. Thing is, crypto collateralized stablecoins are extremely capital intensive and the monstrously volatile nature of crypto assets means they're extremely vulnerable to those kind of classic crypto panic sell-offs that are only too familiar. But this is crypto, home of the most galaxy-brained. And the most galaxy-brained of those galaxy-brained looked at this problem and were like, collateral, Pfft. so bread on woods, bruh. We don't need collateral, bruh. And is that such a crazy idea? After all, the United States said, say ya to the gold standard and isn't now backed by, well, anything. So maybe a stable coin could adopt the same model, but if we, torture our pant metaphor even further. Collateral is basically the stable coin's crotch. And if you remove it, that means you're running crotchless, which begs the question, how on earth do you hold your peg? Maths, bruv, that's how. Magic yourself up an ALG to the mother basing O to balance the circulating supply of the asset itself. When the price rises, Dr. Algo issues more coins. When it falls, it reduces the supply, which is just like the elastic in your pants, expanding to accommodate food intake 
and contracting as you excrete. So let's say a stable coin is designed to be worth a dollar. When it drops to 80 cents, your boy the algo recognizes the imbalance between supply and demand and automatically sets a market buy order to push the price back up. If the price goes above $1, the algorithm sells assets to bring it back down. So futuristic, so wow. But not so fast though. Let me take a minute to Marty McFly all over your parade and sling you carelessly back to the impossibly far ago year of 2014 when you were probably still in high school, you beautiful Gen Z thing you. And two fresh academic papers were published. The first one, Hayek Money, the Cryptocurrency Price Stability Solution by Ferdinando Amitrano and Robert Sams, a note on cryptocurrency stabilization, seniorage shares. In his paper, Amitrano argues that Bitcoin being deflationary is a pretty poor unit of account. Instead, he proposes a rules-based, elastic cryptocurrency that rebases according to demand. With the result that you might wake up one morning with 10% more tokens in your account and think yourself suddenly rich, but the overall value of your holdings has not changed. But that's the re re base at work. In seniorage shares, Sam's put forth a similar model, but with a wicked twist. Instead of rebasing, Sam's system uses two tokens, the supply elastic currency itself and investment shares of the network. And that works like this. Instead of giving out seniorage, we're gonna issue shares that entitle you to future seniorage. Next time we issue new coins and earn that seniorage, shareholders will be entitled to a share of those future profits. There's a party in our pants and everybody's invited. Seniorage is the difference between the face value of money, such as a $10 bill, or a quarter coin and the cost to produce it. In other words, the economic cost of producing a currency within a given economy or country is lower than the actual exchange value, which generally accused to governments who mint the money. Got it? Good, now on with the show. So in other words, even if the smart contract doesn't have the cash to pay me now, because I expect the demand for the stable coin to grow over time, eventually it will earn more seniorage and be able to pay out all of its shareholders. And this allows the supply to decrease and the coin to restabilize to $1. So those shares effectively function as the collateral tying the system together. And you're betting on the future growth of the system continuing. And as long as everyone keeps believing in that growth, then we good. And doesn't that all sound an awful lot like a pyramid scheme? So those papers were published in 2014, and now here in the lofty heights of 2021, we have a clear example of Hayek money in ample force and seniorage shares with empty set dollar and basis cash. And a quick look at the charts of these respective coins tells the same story. Oh yeah, it took off. There were clearly some very tasty incentives at work. And Andrew Kang of Mechanism Capital put it succinctly in his December thread. He said, the key factor with these algorithmic stable coins is that they need to reach scale one to 10 billion plus dollars in order to effectively function as really stable stable coins and to be liquid enough to be useful on mass scale. And that leads to a bit of a conundrum. How do you create enough demand to expand supply if the system hasn't reached threshold stability liquidity yet? The elegant solution, Ponzify it. By entitling the early speculators to greater economic gain, the system is able to bootstrap itself. Those that speculate have an incentive to draw in more speculators, and the more that are drawn in, the more legitimate the systems become. Now, it's probably worth here taking a look at Empty Set Dollar, ESD, which was the most talked about Algo stablecoin last year. And in their introductory Medium article, ESD describes themselves as an experiment, a $330 million experiment. And isn't it so telling that in their comparison chart with other stablecoins, anonymous team is listed as a positive USP. And cast your mind back, do you remember those ICO evangelists proudly showing us their homework on all-star teams in their dossiers about ICOs? How things have changed. Now, Empty Set described their model as stability through user incentivization, using a supply adjustment through emission and redemption of debt, ESD creates a dichotomy of users. Users who are financially interested maintaining the price peg and they will be rewarded with newly minted ESD and users who want to use a stable fiat analog. They are passively holding the token and will accept some dilution for not being active participants.
But here it is that we hit one of the most fascinating dynamics at play in algorithmic stablecoins, reflexivity. Again? Ah, uh, you want to know what reflexivity means, don't you? Okay, listen up. Reflexivity in economics is the theory that a feedback loop exists in which investors' perceptions affect economic fundamentals, which in turn changes investor perception. Think about the way everything in crypto seems to be driven by memes. Yeah, that's reflexivity at work. Now where's my newspaper? So algorithmic supply changes are supposed to be counter-cyclical. Expanding the supply should theoretically reduce price and vice versa. However, supply changes often reflexively amplify directional momentum, and that raises the specter of a paradox. In order to achieve price stability, an algorithmic stablecoin has to expand as fast as possible to a market cap large enough that buy and sell orders don't result in huge price fluctuations. But the only way for a purely algorithmic stablecoin to grow that big is precisely through speculation and reflexivity. And the problem with highly reflexive growth is that it is unsustainable. And what swings violently one way tends to swing back the other way with equal force. No, we're not going to do that. And this brings us back to Andrew Kang's ponzification comment. During the expansion phases, non-holders see that these movements have made token holders wealthy. So they don their fighting pants and enter the game. They buy, pushing up the price and creating further supply expansion until the whole thing unravels and that very same reflexivity precipitates a sharp move in the opposite direction, which hurts. Now, empty set dollar has been live since September and has undergone many expansion and contraction phases. And with one every eight hours, there have now been over 400 supply epochs thus far, and nearly 60% of those have occurred when the time-weighted average price, or TWAP, of ESD is within the $0.95 to $1.05 range, meaning that ESD has in fact been more than twice as stable as Ampleforth. Not bad. Now, another interesting project is Basis Cash, which is a multi-token protocol consisting of three tokens, back, the algorithmic stablecoin, Basis Cash shares, holders of which can claim back inflation when the network expands, and Basis Cash bonds, which can be purchased at a discount when the network is in contraction and can be redeemed for BAC when the network exits its deflationary phase. Now, Evan Kuo of Ampleforth publicly criticized algorithmic stablecoins, saying they rely on debt marketplaces, i.e. bonds, to regulate supply. And he urged people to stay away from these zombie ideas because they will always rely on lenders of last resort. And Ampleforth themselves don't call their token a stablecoin. It's a non-correlated asset but it does target the 2019 value of the US dollar. Now the thing is, there is no lender of last resort to whom bailout costs can be transferred. It's entirely possible for ESD or basis cash to enter into a debt spiral in which debt accumulates without willing finances and the protocol collapses. So where next? Well, as with any blockchain protocol, there are variations and new experiments arriving weekly. Empty set is due to open voting on version 2, which will introduce a reserve requirements, while Frax has created what they call the world's first fractional algorithmic stablecoin, which is partially backed by collateral and partially stabilized algorithmically. To do this, they have not one, not two, but three different tokens. Frax, the stablecoin, Frax shares, a governance and value accrual token, and Frax bonds, which is a debt financing token. However, unlike all the other algorithmic stablecoins discussed thus far, Frax can always be minted and redeemed for a dollar, meaning that arbitrages will play an active role in stabilizing the price of the token. And there's Fay, which will use a bonding curve with an uncapped supply and a low early price to incentivize early adopters during the bootstrapping phase. Now, trying to figure out how you fit these complicated, elastic protocols into something like a lending Lego just makes me want to do this. As with literally everything in crypto, we can say that this is all just one giant scaling problem. There is no one ideal stablecoin, but the experimentation is important. Ferdinando Amitrano referenced F.A. Hayek's seminal 1974 paper, Denationalization of Money, in which he writes, I believe we can do much better than gold ever made possible. Governments cannot do better. Free enterprise, i.e. the institutions that would emerge from a process of competition in providing good money, no doubt would. And perhaps that's where we are now. And there is no doubt that when one tangles with the titanic tremors of crypto, the first thing one will do is put on a pair of pants and face the world confident 
in the knowledge that at least one's most sensitive areas are adequately protected. Or are they? Maybe you roll commando. Underwear would be fine if I were wearing any. And on that note, it's time to end. With thanks to Deribit Insights, Hasib Qureshi, and Andrew Kang for their hard work, this, full of pants, was The Defiant. Well, I guess we're done, aren't we?